Hi, everybody. This is Chris for Grumpy Rody Shop Talk. We were going to go live, but due to technical difficulties, we'll have to do this tape delayed. We're visiting VRTO, which is a virtual reality conference going on in Toronto right now. And with us are two of the people behind the scenes. I'm going to let them introduce themselves. Uh, so let's switch over to them and let's hear what they got to say. Uh, hi, I'm Josh. I've known Chris for a long time. We've done a ton of actual in real life shows. Uh, I am the technical director for VRTO and Constant Change Media Group, um, who uh, hosts the uh, VRTO, the flotilla this year, which is happening in entirely uh, virtual space um, due to obvious reasons. And uh, Karim is there. Hey. Hi, Karim. Hi, I am. Um, I'm uh, Karim, and I'm the executive director, uh, programmer for the show, um, and the guy that figured out how to put a couple of different platforms together, scotch tape something, um, yep. brown box it. They call it when in VR, you call it brown boxing. When you before you build the VR thing, you kind of stick all the boxes in a configuration that might look like an interface. <laughs> and that's what we did. Uh, we said, let's jerry rig some things together, see how it uh, will play. And then a year from now, we'll smooth it all out, you know, and it'll be all integrated. And the uh, experiment worked out pretty well, actually. Mm -hmm. So, how's the response been so far to your conference? Have you gotten a lot of people in, or is it a little slow? And how's that going so far? Actually, it's been great. Um, last year, we were at the Toronto Media Arts Center which was nice, a uh, beautiful space, you know, right by the Drake Hotel. Um, and the problem was that we could only fit so many seats in there, you know, so many foldable chairs. So we actually were pulling back on ticket sales, uh, which was a weird feeling. Like, I want to sell less tickets. <laughs> How do you market something like that? So, um, so this year, actually, there's no limit. You know, you, you, you suddenly realize that if, if you're not just stuck behind a Zoom wall, and you actually have like a space like this, which really does end up feeling like a space. Um, there, you know, there's something called proprioception, which is 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 that sense of how far something is, and VR gives you that back. And right, so dude, you a can have a stereoscopic view. You have basically right. Yeah, and and it's like a sense of depth and dimension and distance. Like they say, you know, the Tai Chi masters tend to say like being on a beach or in a wide open space is really good for the mind uh, because it extends you out. Whereas if you're always in tight little spaces, you have a different kind of a feeling. So right. we actually have different sized spaces. We've got this, this is like, this is a small bump out that we gave to the Ryerson uh, university who had very little time to, to build like a 3d model. But I think what they did is great. They've got these videos and animated GIFs and, you know, you can basically, got these floating signs and you can walk up to this and then have a separate video here. And we did a lot of tweaking to have spatial audio in here. So the closer I get to something the louder it is and I can completely control the drop off. So I could make it so that all these videos could be heard, you know, equally, which is cacophonous and terrible. <laughs> or I could make it so that within two meters of the thing, I start to hear it. Um, so you have, you have this all fine tuning control over the experience. Um, but yeah, the, you know, this is a small space and we've got way bigger, way bigger spaces. And let me just do something here. And um, we I'll should mention out. that, that this is actually hosted in a, a, a piece of um, software called Mozilla hubs. Uh, it's right. brought to you by the same people that uh, do Firefox. Um, so this is, I think we're pushing the envelope. Oh, you're flying. Cool. Uh, I think it's pushing the envelope of, of what it, it was designed to do in the first place. And, uh, they've been really great with working with us and, uh, trying to make our requests happen, which have been many. Yeah. These guys, <laughs> uh, came from something called alt space, which was about five or six years ago, a couple of people saying, Hey, you know, it'd be cool is if we could have 3d, um, spaces that you could network people and have them meet. The problem with Altspace, which eventually got into trouble before Microsoft saved them in a fire sale, 
hmm. is that it was a black box. So you had to download the platform, you had to log in, you know, and all of this other stuff. Whereas the guy, Greg Fodor, who left Altspace to start Mozilla Hub said, this stuff should be open source. It should be on the web. It should have as little friction as possible. And so he created hubs, but hubs itself was just designed to be small meetings on the web in 3D space. And now he's leaving a third time and he's gonna go start something called codenamed JEL, J-E-L, which is designed to handle one-to-many uh, way better than hubs is designed to do. Right. So how did you guys do is, uh, with bandwidth issues? What, what's your attendee numbers roughly on an average been so far? On a daily basis? Well, we, we have two different ways people can access the show. One is they can just look at our streaming app where we've got our video streams of our Q and A's and uh, they've got little community boards and stuff there. And then the other thing that they can do is they can come into Mozilla hubs and in order to control access uh, to these spaces, so you don't just have you know whoever coming in off the internet and causing a ruckus, we uh, did a Hubs Cloud installation. So Hubs Cloud is something that they just released a month ago uh, as a commercial service, um, and it's not expensive. I think you're paying like 30 bucks a year for the subscription, uh, but it's hosted on Amazon Cloud. And so with, the, with Amazon Web Services, you can scale up or down as you need to, right? If you've got a big budget for hundreds of concurrent users, you can scale up to that. Um, but if you're a smaller show like us where you could expect, you know, we've got, I mean, our, our tickets for pro, so-called pro passers uh, are around the 250 range Canadian. So mm -hmm. it's a big filter about, you know, how many tickets you're gonna really sell. Right. And we're looking at about 30 to 45 people per day in that context. Yeah, but um, those are actually like interested, valid people. You won't have like a lot of just casual trolls basically coming in, right? You'll have people that you will basically, by putting up that hurdle, you kind of ensure that people come in are actually interested and want to engage. Yeah, and they're going to behave and they're going to be paying close attention. Uh, there's a lot of VR conferences or not VR conferences, but virtual conferences that boasted these huge numbers. And then you find out that it's free to register and it's all sponsored, right? So those yeah. people don't care. They may not show up. Uh, we, we not only had those people show up, but we now have meaningful relationships with each one of those people. We know what they do, what they're good at. You know, we know what their kids' names are. Uh, <laughs> you know, you really feel like you're showing up at these things and not just seeing another random Zoom head right. on a corner of a so page. It's like quality over quantity as far as the audience well, goes. That was what we talked about yesterday where, where um, in, in Ken's talk where they were talking about like what the difference is between this virtual, you know, virtual experience as opposed to like a real world, like, you know, going from session to session and planning your day by, you know, looking at the the program and running into people in the hallway and oh my god i haven't seen you in 10 years or whatever so all of that is different now so you kind of have to engineer that into the show you have to engineer the social interaction and like that sort of thing like for example today that that uh machinima thing that that you guys did it was was amazing um you know so we created a whole a whole bunch of people that um hadn't really met each other to create a, a, a VR um, experience, like a mini film um, that would have never have done that had it not been for the show. Um, I, want, I want to show you something fun. here really quick. This is a Trinity Square video. You know, they've been around since 1971. They're an artist co-op in Toronto, giving a lot of people a, a, their start. Uh, and they built this little space. And this was actually designed by Matthew Gant, who's an artist. And uh, it's got fog. It, you know, this, this right here means this is a broken link to the screen that we had yesterday. I'll just get rid of that. So I can just hit the space bar, manipulate that object. Here's the Trinity Square floating 3D logo. Uh, there's a little water shader here, fountain. There's collisions, right? So I can't just go through something. It's got physical presence. Uh, and then here's like a super wide video wall that is streaming in a loop uh, and is hosted on Dropbox. So 
I can pick this up. I can move it. You know, yesterday we had the artist in here saying, just move it over to the left a little bit, move it down to the right. And it was just like the real world. It's yeah. so hard um, to do with an actual video wall, as so, you know. So you actually managed to realistically <laughs> simulate the most annoying thing about artists? Exactly right. <laughs> uh, and, yeah, uh, that was the thing. No, but she acknowledged it. You know, she's a brilliant, brilliant oh, artist. Yeah. And she was so like, cool. I know I'm being a picky artist right now. I said, hey, I'm making the point that this is just like the real thing. <laughs> well, exactly. And that's what you're going for, right? It feels like it. I mean, I had uh, I had the director Brett Leonard in here last night, who made Lawnmower Man and Virtuosity. I had artist uh, artist Audrey Phillips, who works at the Vortex Dome in L.A., and they were all standing around here chatting for hours. And and you know, if you think about it, they were all just sitting in their homes where they've been quarantined for the last three months, having a gay old time, talking art, hanging out. You know it. And they, they all said they were so grateful for the experience of being able to have a social gathering again. So much different than a video chat. Oh, yeah, for sure. It's much more immersive. Like, I got to sit in this afternoon a little bit on that on uh, that presentation at two and that little short film afterwards. Yep. And honestly, I got to say, I so wish I had a VR headset because just the level of immersion... You know, that that I it made me want to uh, get into that immersive level, because obviously on a on a 2D screen, it doesn't give you that. Like you were saying earlier, the sense of space and depth, all that. Yeah. And I, but it really drew me in. I really wanted to to be in there and like, honestly, it made me wish I had a VR headset. Right. Yeah. And, you know, this is what I was talking about with proprioception. This look at how big this space is compared to the other ones. Right trying to give you a sense of all these different sizes, but it's all fake. There's nothing changing. It's just an illusion. Because you have all this parallax, you've got big blue skies. Um, everything that we did at VRTO, like all these spaces that you're looking at, they don't come out of the box. These are custom built. We got an artist to follow some of our basic instructions. This guy's awesome. He's out of Guelph. He's been making second life worlds and whatever for 25 years or whatever before that CAD program stuff. But, you know, he said, look, you can give me the basic instructions and then leave me alone. Don't nitpick, mm. don't stand over my shoulder. Let me do my thing. And I was like, yeah, you're an artisan, do your thing. And he came up with these beautiful renderings. But the thing about this too is it's extremely efficient. All I was, the I was light. just gonna say, cause like I, yeah. I studied 3D animation, I've been doing it for years and I know how hard it is to create something this good looking with such a low poly count, right? That yeah, is I mean, a, this is, is like under 50,000 triangles and yeah. this is under 16 megabytes. Yeah, that's literally nothing on a 3D level. So to make it look that good with such low, uh, low resolution and poly counts is, is really tricky. And I gotta say, he did an awesome job of it, it looks great. All these lights are baked in. Um, let me show you something crazy here. So this is the number of objects in the room. There are nine. There's the, the video screen. There's my sign. There's another sign. This is a link. This is another sign and another sign. Another exit point and another exit point. Meaning everything you see here is a single object. All of it is one little blob. And it loads super fast. Now, even with this, as soon as you add 10, 15 people, you start getting performance tr trouble. Uh, we're running a video at 720p, uh, 5K megabits, uh, you know, data rate, and what else? And it's running off of, well, we tested it off of AWS S3 storage, and we tested it off of Dropbox, and we've tested it off of Vimeo. And it, it doesn't seem to be the size of the video or any of that, it seems to be the number of concurrent users in 3D space in the room. In but, the room. Yeah, but yeah. I'll show you what I can do here. If I refresh this page, which will take away all of my inherent controls, I can still stream this room and the tech in the room who's running the video can turn themselves into a bot or a camera. And then everybody in this lobby will simply stream what that person sees. So they've now become a 2D object and not a 3D object that has to calculate all of their Cartesian coordinates in real time, right? Right, yeah. So, so when you have overflow, you can do that. Right. Yeah, yeah. So I'll, I'll, 
So you yeah. basically you have to always keep in mind your performance limits as far as your audience size goes in in each of, in each space. Yeah, it's like amp amp ampage. You know, it's like yeah. yeah. Well, it's, I think of it as uh, as a sound guy. I think of it as coverage. You know, like if you want to reach, you know, the 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 high balcony and stuff, you have to have speakers up there, and each speaker is a piece of bandwidth. You know. Yeah. No. I mean, it, it makes total it, sense. It, right? You only ha you only have twenty speakers available you know one per one per user then you know that's what you get um it, if, you, if you want more speakers you got to buy more <laughs> yeah no to totally makes sense um i'll show you what a video looks like when i play it so it looks beautiful like like in your movie theater i don't know what this is josh oh, this is uh this is the machinima oh that's our a, opening that short film from this afternoon yeah 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 no. we'll watch a couple seconds of this okay so you can see here it says volume is user specific so each person can turn up or down their own volume it's there's no master volume uh, mm -hmm. but the controls are universal so if anybody decides well, that they're gonna hit rewind it's for everybody actually no that's not true it's it's only for the the key users right i mean you can disable yeah. the playback you, you can controls. disable you can disable people's ability to do that but yeah so there you so go let me turn this back up again I'm not hearing the audio right now. Okay, let me see. Oh yeah, I just don't have it on the. Uh, okay. Well, anyway. Yeah, I don't so have it, it on my monitor. I I see the view let meter going, so yeah. it should be okay for the recording. Yeah, sure. Oh, okay. Cool. Maybe I'm not sharing my audio from the space. Maybe well, that's worst like case a... scenario, I recorded that this afternoon when I was watching it. <laughs> oh, hang on. Here it is. Look at OBS, this. So I she got a computer sound. It in later. But sure. sure let's, let me go back and just pretend like we just did that for the first okay. time. So, Since all we're right, not so live, we can do that. Yeah. <laughs> let me show you um, what a video looks like in here. I just set the zoom to share computer sound, so we should be good. We had a little bit of black at the front. There we go. So I can raise and lower my volume on an individual basis. There's no master volume. It's a per user thing. So you can crank it up without disturbing the, the guy next to you. Yeah, That's right. Or you can yeah. hear everybody breathing if you want by muting yourself here. A little disclaimer. This is for the machinima contest we ran. And today we had the, the award show or whatever. Premiere. Why not visit the Flotilla Confession Stand for delicious beverages and snacks? So as you can see, this is just playing in line. And the other thing is, if I'm far away, I've got people blocking me or whatever, I can actually right click on the screen and make it full screen um, and listen to it basically at Unity Gain. And then I can also... Um, I can also mouse over the object in the object list and I can see it there too. So the problem of sight lines disappears. You know, you can have the feeling of being in the room with people and getting their reactions, but you can totally overcome the problem of someone standing in front of you. Right. Get the tall guy out of my way. Yep. Yep. That's cool. um, I can message stuff down at the bottom here. Uh, I'm not going to do a whole hubs tutorial, but you know, I can text yeah. people in the room like shut up. <laughs> um, I can also like look at the user list and I can click on them change. I, I can individually change my own avatar, but if there was a group of people in here, I could mute everybody in the room or individually mute people, kick people, whatever. So those mod controls are actually quite new to hubs. Um, and they're adding more of them all the time. So you've got better control over the crowd as a moderator. Um, and then and the other the only other detail I'll give you about this room is like the default spatialized audio has a very, very small fall off. Like you could not hear each other at all unless you were standing right on top of them. 
And so Josh and I tweaked this out. So he would stand over at that end and I'd stand over here. We'd count to 10 and approach each other and start to see like when the proximity started to kick in. And then when you were in the sort of circle of influence of their audio, um, and then you can control the voice independently of the media. So uh, when I'm building this room, I'm essentially baking the room and publishing it to be used as a scene, um, I can decide what kind of characteristics microphones have versus playback media. Right. And they can be totally separate from each other in terms of the, the, the throw, essentially, of their range. Oh, that's, that's pretty cool. So basically, you, you've, you've got as, pretty much the same kind of control over the situation as you do in the real world kind of show, and even more so in some extents. In some extents, yeah, you, do, you just don't have to deal with acoustics. Right. So there's there's no there's no wall reflections. So it's all direct sound, no matter what. Yeah. Or well, delay. Therefore, in that you sense. gotta deal with uh, yeah. other things like stream lags and whatever else. So I mean, I'm sure there's still mm. plenty of challenges. Yeah. Technical. So how many people oh, yeah. do you have working like behind the scenes compared to what you would have <laughs> on a, on an actual real world show? Of That's a two part question. Calibers? How many people should we have, and how many people do we have? Yeah. Well, both. <laughs> Let's hear both. <laughs> to be honest. You, you don't need a major crew. I, you know, at first no. Josh didn't even know what his job was going to be. It, it was like, what do I do here? And, yeah. and he was sort of helping me kick the tires and being the guy that listens when I, you know, step away and step closer. But eventually we realized that me trying to record the screen, moderate the talk, use chat on discord and put the media up on the wall was ridiculous. So Josh became my media wrangler and he'll show up at the given time. Uh, you know, I'll tell you another major, when you watch this three months from now, this is going to seem cute because right now, if you want to put up a video, you have to do this. Um, essentially I'd have to put the link down in the chat line here and then hit this little wizard button and it would spawn a frame and then I have to move the frame into position, enlarge yeah. it, and pin it onto the plane where it's showing. Um, I think right you saw now, me do that today. Yeah, I did. I, I think was watching Josh do, that, do yeah. that today, so I know yeah. exactly what you mean. Usually that's yeah, my it's, job. Yeah, it's a pain in the ass. The video to fit the screen. <laughs> so it was nice yeah, that's to see an audio guy have to do that for a change. <laughs> I was actually yeah, thanks, sitting here Chris. chuckling watching him do that. You're like, oh, I feel your pain. Yeah. yeah, I mean that's that was that's what Josh does. But you know, at first it seems like like a like a derpy little thing but once you have five talks going on and you've got seven or eight speakers that have to be mic checked because they've got macs and they've got tablets and well that's and, the thing because you know, we're using we're using discord as 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 the q a uh audio channel afterwards so i'm i'm getting the speakers wrangled and getting them into my our mic check channel so i can make sure they don't sound like you know they're in a bathroom and you know, or in, you know next to a subway or something getting to put headphones on and you know mic checking them and yeah and, and then you know making sure stuff runs on time so it's sort of like half stage manager half video playback guy yeah, that's and accurate. half sound guy yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, the one thing Josh can't do is mix, and I wish that he could yeah. mix uh, in real time. There's no interface for that. Um, no. But what I was going to say just before I forget is like Hubs right now has taken comments from people like us and others and are implementing a, a media um, interface more or less for Hubs where you could effectively target a media frame and say, just sling this oh, yeah. Yeah, to that shot. spot like, no, and don't you know, don't make me have to okay. like zhuzh it around. Mm -hmm. um, so you can preset targets right. and then and sling your media at them. So that would be a huge difference. Yeah, you wouldn't have to scale it and like, you know, right. like you you're saying the keystoning issue that we to, had. To the surface you're placing it on kind of. Exactly, so you got a 16 by nine frame that, that exists and you can define that in in 2D in a 3D space, and that becomes a media window, and you just throw your media at it, and it scales. And it's that's what we'd like. <laughs> <laughs> it's not real yet, but but it should be, you know, within a month or two, and it'll just get better and better. Yeah. Um, so let me just show you a completely different kind of space. We've seen the Trinity Square space, which is still somewhat literal. We've seen the FCAD space, which is a little bump out. You've seen that I've got five, four expo halls that are like big like this, and they've been used in different ways. But 
I'm going to show you a basic vo uh, photogrammetry uh, piece that someone gave me. They decimated this model way down, and it's a super quick load um, for a really beautiful effect. So you can see there's two, three objects. Look how fast that came in on a web page. Two objects on a almost photoreal. Thing. Check this out. So this took me about four minutes to put this scene together. He sent me the model, which includes all of this floor plane and this mosque, uh, which I, he came in and he's like, oh, it feels a little small. So I just scaled it up in the, in the spoke designer. Um, I added a little water sound effect that is like an ambient sound versus a, a specific point sound. I added a, a giant water shader for the ocean. I, f I toggled on the fog setting and I added a derpy little low poly olive tree here just for parallax. And then and you got the scene and that's it. And I can go in here and look around. And this is just running in a normal web page using 3JS code basically. Yeah, I mean, you, you can tell it's a photogrammetry object just by looking at the geometry, but it's still pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, it's it's been decimated to hell, and you can tell. But yeah. it's it, you do get the you do get the feeling of space. You do you do get the mood of 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 the environment, which is yeah, exactly is the the whole thing. Like you know, obviously the the photogrammetry part would be far more detailed. But um, yeah. and the fact that I can go between these walls is actually. Uh, is actually the fact that photogrammetry is a bit of a mis misnomer here. This is actually a yeah. LIDAR scan. That's why yeah, they have the spaces in between. Right, so it's a point cloud, essentially, originally. Mm -hmm. Yes, right. But and with it looks photos, beautiful but with in the original. But... It in because there, is, there are actual photographs in there. Yeah, there's, there's yeah. definitely textures that have been added yeah. through yeah. photogrammetry. Yeah. Yeah. I know that workflow. I've done that a million times, convert a point cloud to actual geometry and then texturing it. It's yeah. a lot of work. And a lot of data to handle. That's that's what VFX is all about too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Fun. And so another thing is just a quick thing is like, do you notice how when I click on these rooms, I'm going right between the rooms? They're basically connected in line. Um, that's because all of these are on our same server. Um, whereas if you were on vanilla hubs, you know, the publicly available one, and you did that. Um, you would be opening a new tab basically and you wouldn't get that kind of seamless transfer like here I, I it says visit room but if this was not using the same url like we are doing uh, it would say open link and open in a separate tab right so basically those doors to the rooms would just be hyperlinks to another web page right yeah but here they they're smart enough to know like they're sort of a continuum um, and it opens up in the same tab as opposed to a separate one. There's your sponsors. Yeah, so you can have a nice little, this is like super easy. You paste the thing with an alpha and in you go. Um, you know, I put little diegetic instructions on the way, like press the space bar for options, right click to zoom stuff, just little cues that help people who come in for the first time and have no idea what's going on. Yeah, well, those tips helped me this afternoon when I had a look around. To get to get kind of the hang of the navigation, especially if you're looking at, at it on a screen and you don't have that level of immersion, it kind of yeah. get it's easy to get lost in the navigation quickly if you don't know what you're doing. Yeah, so absolutely. So little tips like that definitely help. And you can enter any of this size. on 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 any device that'll run a, a web page, which is great. Pretty much anything except a potato these days. And yes, I don't know, right. I've seen potatoes with the <laughs> Ethernet connector, so I'm not so sure. <laughs> That's great. Another thing about this design I want you to keep in mind is like it's not there's no right angles. We want it to have a non-orthogonal space. Uh, it also has multiple levels, which is self-evident. This is again, this is Whistler, the designer's brilliance, how he he figured that out. Um, just having these little you know slight ramps up and down to to do several things. One is it intellectually separates these ideas as spaces. The other thing it does is it gives you vantage points. So if you're hanging out in here, you can go, like, oh yeah, there's Bob and Ed over there. Mm -hmm. And and yet you have enough social separation that you can have your own party and not have to feel like you're all stuck in the same room. You know, I've got a little bump out here. I could have a cocktail reception here. We could do like a private meeting. I could stick up another portal. I could bring in a 3D object. 
and still have a view of everything that's going on. Um, notice that there's no walls because we said, why do you need walls? There's no need for walls. Like we can have the same sort of mental breakout without having to rely on the conventions of the real world. So all of these things are part of the design consideration. Yeah, that's actually like a really good idea. I, I like the way those those little islands, I'll call them for lack of a better word, you know, kind of mm -hmm. give you thematic areas you can go to. And yeah. it, w it would totally make sense. Like you can stand there with like your two buddies and discuss whatever you just saw in, in depth without disrupting anybody else or being disrupted by anybody else, but you can still kind of follow what's going on on the big picture. So that's that's a really cool idea. I like that. I'm just going to do a fly out here. Now, I don't let my guests fly. Um, I can turn that on or off because, you know, sometimes you don't want them to look behind the stage. Uh, <laughs> they want to see all the gaff tape. If you want to see what this model looks like, it's pretty <laughs> glorious. Well, you like, can't check let this everybody have a backstage pass. No, no. Yeah, so that's the, there you go. There's a big wide shot. Yeah, it looks so that's cool. mostly one object you're looking at other than the uh, media portals and all that and the signs. And the sky box is just a box. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Is it a box or a sphere? It's actually a box. Really? Like, like if I, yeah, if I get to the edge, you start to see the corners. It's really weird. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. So they're doing really every trick in the book to reduce the geometry count. You well, yeah, it. and the and the lighting too is 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 pretty critical too because they, they it's it's one big overhead light that's baked in. So right. There's no like, um, you no know, dynamic specific, there lighting. You go, there's a corner. No dynamic lighting and all that. I mean, you could, you totally could, but then you're you're eating up, you know, you're eating up your count there. Oh, you were in the Truman Show. Light. Yeah. Oh my God, we're in the Truman <laughs> Show. <laughs> Crazy, right? Yeah. Yeah. There you, you, just, go. you can hear the boat going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh God, my life isn't real. But it really works. I mean, when you're in there, you yeah. can't see those seams at all. No. Yeah. It'll be interesting far to see, like, over the next couple of years how it develops, especially with the current breakthroughs in in, in graphics card qualities and yeah. and real time ray tracing and stuff like that becoming a thing now. Five G. Yeah, so all those things are obviously going to step up the quality and the bandwidth and the poly count and all that to make it even better and better going forward. Oh, you bet. I mean, at our conference, which is actually about this stuff, like it's not like we were doing, you know, a Shriners convention. We're, <laughs> we're talking about WebGL and uh, 3JS and um, social VR and all that kind of stuff. And that community is teeny tiny. I mean, on one level... It's big if you look at something like VR chat or Rec Room or whatever that has a lot of end users. But the people that are doing the core web VR stuff are, it's a tiny, tiny cluster. Um, but th what they're doing is so deep that once, and now they're picking up a lot of momentum. I mean, these guys have been around five, six, seven years, eight years, 12 years. Uh, VRML guys from like the 90s, you know, Bernie Rowell, et cetera. But but they're they're really starting to build a groundswell now, and you know we're talking about real estate that you pay for with cryptocurrency that's built with voxels, and you've got your own parcel of land, and there's people like running legitimate shoe shops out of there, and car sales and real estate sales, um, all happening in your web browser. And on top of that, you could use A-frame code to embed one kind of VR world inside of another. So. If I was running Janus XR, which is another kind of like hubs-like thing, um, I could open a hubs world inside of a Janus world, inside of a crypto voxels world, and basically <laughs> pilot like miniature versions of myself in three different realities at the same time. So just to give you an idea of how nuts it's going to get, that's what those, we're doing these days. Those crazy kids and their <laughs> crypto weirdos. And it's yeah. going to get crazier and crazier. <laughs> but, but what we do need, actually, and this was a conversation that we was, was had, uh, James from Janice pointed this out, is like they've been working a lot with the, the what is it, the DMX lighting um, yeah, hardware. Yeah. I'm going to be connecting him with, with uh, some, some uh, auto work LDs that work in uh, WYSIWYG and other, other 3D uh, rendering type stuff so that, uh, yeah, they can actually... 
you know, d design, you know, when you would do predictions, uh, well, I can only speak on the, uh, the audio side when you do predictions in, in uh, audio prediction software and on a, on a 3D, on a CAD drawing or something like that, uh, but do it for lighting and do it for real so that they could actually have a properly uh, programmed and, you know, um, designed show like you would normally and, and throw your fixtures up and figure out your cable lengths and all that kind of stuff that you would normally do. Um, Not just as a previs. Technology does exist no, no. to do that in like Unreal Engine. Like I know people that, yeah. that have DMX feeds into Unreal Engine are doing uh, controlling a real uh, lighting rig that yep. way. Exactly. Yeah. You got but it. that's what they're looking for. Like that. That's what that's what the guys at Janus were were asking about. And and you know I said well yeah I kind of know some people that do that. So yeah <laughs> that that'll be happening in the next few days after our show's over and, and it's not just now that you have to use real unreal engine like they're talking about doing this with a web-based vr yeah. environment so you could use a web 3d environment to control a dmx rig and vice versa you could use a dmx rig to control lights inside the vr environment right well i and, mean you know, when you're doing it's just Fortnite, a question of processing power and bandwidth to get that done right mm -hmm. sure it's always it's always the bottom that's line. always bottom line yeah exactly yeah with everything yeah. And how many people are coming in on MacBook Airs? That's the real bottom bottleneck. <laughs> Maybe I'm me. I'm just teasing, Josh. <laughs> Thanks. No, but no, I'm, 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 I'm with I'm you on that Pro. one. I, I'm an anti-Apple guy personally myself. I don't like to be patronized by my hardware, but that's just me. <laughs> hey, it works great for every audio application I've ever needed. It's Better fine. It, the, point is that, the point is that it's no not matter Not for video what, at all. No, no matter what you do, you're going to have somebody who's on a Mac and somebody who's on, yeah. you know, a 486 Windows computer and yeah. someone <laughs> who doesn't have a mouse. And yeah. unlike a real life show where people just got to show up with a pair of running shoes and a bottle of water, every single person here is coming in a different door at a different time, in a different way, in a different language. In a different time zone. Yeah. And you got to solve for that, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, so you how do you approach that? Because obviously you have to set the, the limitations somewhere with hardware. Obviously you can't design it in a way, you know, like you said, that you can, that you expect to be able to run it on a 486DX2 or something like that running at 50 <laughs> oh, megahertz, God. right? Yeah, so, you're right. I mean, obviously you've, you've got you've to set your target audience to a minimum hardware spec. You got it. You got to say to people, look, you, you got to be reasonable here. I mean, there's a certain yeah. point at which I can't accommodate. But one thing about VRTO is that we we tried and 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 you know I was really open and transparent with my audience. I said, look, you guys are not the audience on the other side of the you know of the curtain. We're all in this together. We're gonna try some crazy stuff. We're gonna learn about it. And I said, you you know, we had one woman from Strathmore University in Kenya on like a second generation smartphone and she was attending, you know, yeah. using patchy she had a, she had internet. a custom avatar. She was, she presented, it was, it was awesome. And well, she yeah. was actually the most active community leader who got everybody going. And I'm so glad that she was able to attend. Right. And not just like mm -hmm. people on elite gamer systems who might've been too cool for school or whatever. I mean, I'm not saying all people are like that, but mm -hmm. just, Letting anybody in can always bring you really good results. Uh, the other thing we had to do was because we were running a video streaming component on a conference app, in this case, Whova, um, which is also where our speakers and schedule were listed. And we're doing hubs where you've got to register and come in and using Discord as a voice and uh, messaging backbone you have to ask yourself, how do I minimize the number of instructions, the number of clicks to get somebody from zero to the other side of the wall? And you experienced that today, um, trying to get into the show. Yeah. yeah, you did. Yeah, I had I had some initial confusion kind of to figure out what, what was going on where, but with a little help from Josh and trying out stuff, it worked pretty well, actually. Yeah. I just, I mean, I, the main thing was I wanted you to be on Discord and you're like, oh, I haven't used Discord yet. And I'm like, well, get on it. And then oh, yeah, the only thing I had set good. up is, dis with, is set up the grumpy roadie <laughs> presence on Discord, but I've never yeah. used it since. So yeah, once but, you were uh, there, it was fine. I mean, it's, it's really just navigating web pages after that. Yeah. And like with Discord, we did another major thing, which is like, 
Discord lets you have your own free server. It's your own social network, basically. But if you you have to think about the taxonomy of a space, like you have to say, how do we organize channels? Is there a speaker channel, a VIP channel, a staff channel? And then those things all have separate permissions. Oh God, and, yeah. You know, you haven't lived until you've worked through a Discord permissions array. I'm making a T-shirt that says that for sure. <laughs> 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 but Josh and I had to basically for two weeks just go oh. through it over and over again and say, okay, now log in as this kind of user. Now what channels do you see? What can yeah. you say? What can't you do? Um, and then we distilled all of that down into a single bot. And the bot now says, if I, cr if I write this code, right? Basically when I show up, I'll show up in the self check-in channel. And if I type in X speaker, it'll automatically unlock access to the exact channels that a speaker should see. And if I'm an exhibitor, I'll only see the channels an exhibitor should see. Right. So we basically created an entire virtual conference just inside of Discord. And all you need is one line of one so little code to type in. So basically what, it, what that is, is, is the color of your badge. So you yeah, all access, right. do you have, do you have, you know, are you a performer? Are you AAA? Are you, what are you, you know? Are you, are you, do you, are you an ass pass? Like what, what is it? Like, so, so that's what that is. So, so actually designing that through, through discord was, was a challenge, but I mean, you know, if you, if you relate it in your head to the real world, then, then it starts to make more sense, but oh my God, you should see the paperwork and the notes that I had. Mm -hmm. It was, it was like, <laughs> it was, it was challenging. Josh uh, hated discord at first, but now he can't live I, without no, it. I, now I can't live without it. No, it's fantastic. Yeah. It was it was a it was a it was a jump for me, but because uh, I'm always the guy that like just make it easy for me. <laughs> but you know when that I when I saw what the work that it took to make it easy for someone, then I understood. Yeah, and our job like, okay. our job is to take <laughs> all those cables and put them under the carpet. Yeah, we 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 are we basically made a shit ton of cable ramps, probably forty miles of cable ramps. <laughs> Been there, done that. I know. The <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But, it, but it's but it really really works i mean people from yep. all, all kinds of walks of life all kinds of ages and generations all kinds of skill sets got in there and immediately they were like fish being let into a fish tank they just started swimming around talking to people doing stuff sharing links and they had no idea what had gone into hurting them into the right position basically. i think the other the other hurdle was um the the you know, getting people into the space was one thing, but once they were there, you, telling them, hey, you know what you can do? You can create stuff. You can yeah. grab shit from, from Google Poly and, and like, you know, create an easy chair to hang out in, or, you know, you can show yeah, us your latest you YouTube link or whatever. You can, you, whatever you want to do, you can just, yeah, there you go. There's Google Poly. So yeah, there's, there's a scooter. Go ride your scooter or, yeah, or, or throw it off into the abyss or whatever. But yeah. you can do all that stuff and you have permissions to do that. And you're like, oh God, I can do that. That's great. So, so it becomes like, you know, when people get used to, you know, emojis in chat, this becomes a whole other level, like creating GIFs and all that kind of stuff. A whole other level in 3D, right. you know, there you go. So there's a video, of some silly cat, whatever. Anyway, yeah, so... They're this also has its own levels of, of permissions. Yeah. Like I, you know, yeah. I can make somebody a room moderator. I can also go up here and say room settings. And this is a per room element. I can say how many people can come into this room before they're basically held in the lobby, mm -hmm. which is a, you know, balcony seat. Um, is this room publicly listed on our, on our menu or is it private? Um, what can people do? Can they move and create objects? Yeah, can they yeah. create a camera? Can they pin something? Pinning is a very powerful tool because it means once you leave, that object is persistent in that room. And if it it's not in, yeah. checked, at the, per the, the time that the person who created the object leaves, it's garbage collected and thrown out. Okay. So if you, I, I assume you can you can kind of get rid of pro uh, objects that people leave behind to prevent clutter. If you're a moderator, you can. Yeah. yeah. There's um, an eraser on the ground. Speaking of which, no, it's a it's a it's a funky little. Uh, anomaly object. Um, oh, okay. It yeah. looks like a, it looks like a blackboard eraser because there's so, a blackboard around the corner there. I can also clone things. <laughs> I can rotate them. I can, um, you know, whatever. Uh, I can pause it. I can add physics to it. Um, I can pe peg my camera to follow the object. 
anyways, that's going to become too much of a deep dive course. Yeah, but yeah, no, but it, can... it's definitely interesting to see the, the the possibilities. And obviously, you know, we could go on for hours and going into what mm -hmm. you could do. <laughs> yeah. But like what 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 interests me is kind of right now is the demographic of your audience. You mentioned earlier that it's mainly people that work or create in VR or are interested in, in doing that? Not at all, actually. We, no. have, we have school teachers, we have yeah. uh, accountants, we have musicians, we've got um, educators, like I already said that. Uh, <laughs> we have anything you could imagine. We've got projection mappers, we've got moms, we've got dads, we've got teenagers, we've got... Um, it's all over the board. I mean, there are people from Syria, from Korea, from India, from Guatemala. Um, they are in, you know, when you're, when you're talking about VR, and I say this all the time, I say, look, we don't run a VR show. We run a culture show that uses immersive media to accomplish its goals. Okay. And, and I saw that five, I, I, I'm going to, it's toot my own horn, I guess. I saw that five or six years ago coming as a need because I'm, I'm intellectually, I'm a prepper. I don't mean like in a weird prepper way. I mean, I've always been ready for the apocalypse. <laughs> and I was like, there's going to be a time when something you're a, you're a tech prepper, climate change or zombies <laughs> or, or a pandemic are going to force us to not be able to go where we want to go when we want to go. And we're going to need these kind of spaces as our proxy. Um, and I also thought, we're also going to use IOT to like leverage using this space. So like I want to be able to pilot a giant three story robot down the street to clean up, you know, cars that are floating down the flood channel. Right. Um, and that's what this is going to be for. And that's why the DMX thing is really important to me because I will be in a space like this and I will flip a switch and it will do something in the real world. And, and so my show is not about VR. My show uses VR to ask people from around the world what they know and what they want to talk about. Okay, that makes sense, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And those people all know something about VR too. That's, I guess, the common thread. Well, I, I guess, yeah, that's, that's usually the case if you have early adopters, which many of those people probably are, right. I would assume. Much like yourself, when you if you say you've been doing this uh, or looking into this for five five or six years or whatever, well, that's you know? just the the. But this is the fifth year of VRTO. Yeah, this is our right. show is five years old as yeah. a conference. And how do you feel it's progressed and developed in those five years, like compared to what you started out with? Well, we went in we went in feet first. Like the first year, I decided to do this. I'd been going to the NAB show for fifteen years in a row. Um, like an like an annual pilgrimage, and my mom, you know, worked with telefilm, and she's always been in media, so I was always kind of soaked in this stuff. But um, the first year we did this show, I said, let's just do it in the in the heart of the spiritual heart of Toronto, and let's do it at Maple Leaf Gardens. So we rented out Maple Leaf Gardens, <laughs> and uh, oh God. Just invited anybody <laughs> that would listen to us. Um, and it went, it went pretty good. I mean, I completely over-programmed it. I think I had like 85 <clears throat> speakers in the first year. Um, over three days. Over three yeah, days. Over three in, days. In over... seven, seven locations, I think it was? Yeah. It was yeah. lots of stuff happening. Yeah, All scattered it, uh, throughout, throughout the Matame Center. It's, it's now called the Matame Center. It's not Maple Leaf Gardens anymore. Yeah. But yeah, uh, so in little tiny rooms and little, in big rooms and all over the place. And, and managing that as the AV lead was a good time. I can imagine. Well, I know it was the good that me and Josh well. have known each other for 30 years. Yeah, so we can, <laughs> not, you know, we can sort of knock them, sock them and still get up the next day together on this stuff. Yeah, but exactly. uh, rock them, sock them. So, yeah. And then and then the next three years we were at Ryerson's uh, FCAD building and it was the same thing. Like I was trying to I was trying to overwhelm people on purpose. I had sessions on both sides of the hall happening at the same time, like you'd see at NAB or SIGGRAPH, mm -hmm. because I wanted people to get a little piece of one thing, cross the hall, run into somebody, go to another room, find another bit of something, and then synthesize all those ideas. Eventually people said to me, you know, dude, this is too much. Like, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know where to be. So last year when we moved to the Toronto Media Arts Center, uh, 
we did a single stage setup and people liked it. You know, they, they were able to focus on one thing at a time, but uh, what we found out too, was that like, nobody really wanted to sit there for eight hours a day. And after day two, they were like, I can't take any more. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So this year uh, we, you know, we adapted on a lot of fronts, not just moving virtually, but we also said, look, let's have people, first of all, not do live talks because live Zooms can just be a total mess. Um, let's just have them pre-tape or live to tape a 15 minute talk presentation as a catalyst. And then we'll go into discord and we can unpack that thing for as long as people want to hang. And, um, and we'll just do the whole thing within a four hour block on any given day. So 2 PM to 6 PM Eastern, which ends up being 11 AM to, to 2 PM Western, which is a comfortable time frame for anybody. They can either come in after lunch or before lunch and everybody loved it. And then the final thing we said was, why do we need to do this over three days? And, you know, people who buy a ticket might miss the whole thing because they have a, a home crisis of some kind. Right. So we said, let's do it over 30 days. Well, and I mean, especially since you're not renting like the Madame or the, the thing, right? So you, ha you can yeah. kind of be a little more elaborate with your time frame. Right. And there's well, no hotels. There's no like, you know, travel airplane tickets, nothing. Yeah. Right. Well, the other thing is, too, that like you don't want a lot of these people are doing these, you know, face to face things that we're doing right now for hours a day anyway. And it just becomes too much. Uh, you know, that whole Zoom burnout thing, catchphrase, whatever. But it's a real thing. And, and yeah, you know, sure. you want to you want to be able to just, you know, have you want to go to the conference for sure. And that's your motivation. You want to go there, but you don't want to sit there for nine hours in front of your computer. Right. I got to say, as an as a VR operator or a, 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 sorry, a, a, a operator in this show, uh, what's been different from a regular show is I can sit up and I have my like right here. I have my workout rig. So as a video is playing, I can just go and do some crunches and I can, you know, do all yeah. I can go to the bathroom. I can get a snack it's in the in the kitchen you know so that's been amazing like because you know before you, you can work you know in your what pajamas like. basically yeah I mean, yeah I, I i don't have pants on right now what are you talking about you know what are pants hit exactly so so yeah i mean it's it's that's been really freeing and like wow i can't you know even my wife said you know i can't believe like you're able to eat lunch because you know before like the first you know um you know what it's like, Chris, like, you know, being, oh, yeah. being stuck to your, stuck to your uh, render machine and, you know, processing endless PowerPoints and splitting screens and God knows what the hell else you're doing. Reformatting, uh, you know, re-rendering every video. Yeah. It's in every God given format. Right. You just, mankind. you just can't leave, but, but now you can, you can actually get up out of my chair and walk around and I can yell at a speaker if I want, because my mic's on mute. <laughs> you know, I can say you bloody idiot, whatever, yeah. you know, I can, I can do all that stuff. Not that he would ever think that. Oh, I would never. Our speakers never, are all lovely. Of course not. That was purely <laughs> hypothetical. Yeah, well, yes. yeah. I, if I wanted to, I could heckle. You know, <laughs> playful heckling. Uh, but yeah, you know, so so the, there is a bit of freedom uh, doing it this way. And, and, and I, I think, well, first of all, this is never going away. Um, you know, plane tickets aren't going to get any cheaper. No, I was going to say, this, and, this and is going to be more and more happening in the oh, future. Yeah. Major yeah. conferences are not going to... Um, have the, the the sort of numbers that they they would have before. So this this type of thing is going to be a permanent fixture. Um, so well, which it's is cool. why we're talking about it on yeah. this channel, right? Because exactly. this will be a part of our day to day job for event technicians to include yeah. these I mean, kind of things. Who knows? Like if if there's a major conference happening in Europe in the next week, which is all wide open, nobody from the states can go. Yeah. Right. So, you well, know, they can't really go anywhere. Nobody wants them around right well, now, but, I think. <laughs> fine. But but they just physically can't like like uh, I heard about a, a private plane that that landed in uh, Italy uh, today and uh, they were turned away. Uh, yeah. They were from Colorado. They're like, nope, sorry. Um, I don't know what they were thinking, but, you know. <laughs> but yeah, if there's a point I was going to make before that we are going to need people that have your skill sets to advise on how to make a better show. And just like yeah. I need to become friends with architects, I need to become friends with costume designers and 
all of those like lighting people and every you know thing because the the we the VR world is not um, the first thing you're going to learn is to treat the VR world like the real world. Instead of having a God mode button where you can extinguish everybody that bothers you, instead <laughs> you put up a mic stand and say, look, whoever's standing in front of the mic stand has got the floor. And yeah. if, you want, if you want security, you put security guards in. You don't have like bug zappers. You can't, you know, <laughs> you got to think of the, the real world as the model for behavior inside of VR. The way it looks can be up to, for grabs. You can create whatever abstract thing you right. want. But, the but those kind of the, dynamics. The stuff has yeah. to be like molded yeah. after the real world. Yeah, that makes sense. Otherwise, you destroy the immersive effect too, right? If you suddenly have to change the way you interact and behave, then that kind of takes you out of the moment and out of the immersion. Well, and also people know how to behave if it is of that, you know, people just know will know how to behave, behave in, a, in, a, in a setting like that. I mean, gamers yeah. already Hopefully. know the etiquette. They understand yeah. the protocol of like muting yourself, of like how close to stand. And there are people that in the real world might have manners, but they come in here and they start acting like monkeys. Like, oh, I can just say whatever I want and yell and do whatever I want because it's just VR. And it's like, no, nope, actually it matters just as much. And you have to have the same courtesy and the same protocol. Yeah. Right. Same right. etiquette. I mean, because we all, all know that one nine-year-old gamer that just constantly sings while you're trying to play, I don't know, Call of Duty or something. <laughs> yeah. And just kind of spams everybody with his nine-year-old voice and That's totally right. destroys it for everybody. So, yeah, obviously you, you you don't want that. So you need some level of, of moderation and, like you said, putting in, like, securities or whatever yeah. and making people behave like they would in the real world makes – more than sense especially since vr is going to get more and more realistic and immersive as time progresses mm. we just ran a professional conference in this cartoony looking thing and everybody took it drop dead seriously there yeah. was nobody who was like i'm not going to go to that weird crazy land of random things they treated this show like they were walking into a building that there were times where talks were going to happen there was a stage where that was going to happen and they treated it with all of the dignity and credibility that you would if you were walking into a professional conference, because we acted like that. Yeah, and that's the end of the, at the end of the day, I guess that's what makes the, the the experience right. It's not the look of the space as much as the the feeling of the interaction and interacting with each other is what a conference is actually about, right? Yeah, mm. it's not the color of the carpet or the wallpaper or whether you're at the MTCC or whether you're at the Sheraton Center or who knows where, right? That's right. It's yeah. secondary to your conference. It's, it's about the yeah. content and the interactions, I guess. Yep. A designer, as a designer, would argue with you, but uh, I agree with you. Well, yeah. no, I mean, it's, I'm, it's, I'm it's a little it. in between the chairs there since I'm a 3D artist myself and a video yeah. guy, so I mm -hmm. obviously have uh, my eye on the visual, but at the same time, I'm also a gamer, and I've... I've done live shows for a very, very long time. Mm -hmm. So I understand both sides of the coin, right? And yeah. I, I got to admit, you know, finding that right balance between visual complexity and functionality is one thing, but like making the experience and the interaction work, I think is more important for the average viewer or average uh, visitor to a conference like that. Because, you know, yeah, I look at something and I go like, oh, yeah, that's a really, really low poly count, right? That's the first <laughs> thing that I see when I look at an object. Your yeah. average viewer won't go there. You will go like, oh, yeah, look at that. Look at that logo or what's that say on that sign? Yeah, right. You know? Mm -hmm. and, and it's amazing how fast they adapt to that. And I've always said um, that, you know, the people that are pursuing VR for hyper photorealism and worrying about getting, you know, the latest real-time ray tracing NVIDIA card or whatever, um, are not necessarily getting VR correctly because the most terrifying experience I ever had in VR was a 640 by 480 demo on the Oculus developer kit. Oh yeah. And I mean, I I was like gripping onto the chair, I was falling over, I was screaming. It was like my first real VR experience, and it was all low poly. And yeah, I remember you know, my first VR experience. This was back in the 90s. 
Sure. Yeah, oh sure. boy. And yeah, the there boys you go. at at the at the Hanover trade show, and they're basically hmm. they were demoing. This is this was a backroom demo back then, still, right? And they were yeah. running three twenty by two forty per eye, <laughs> right? At frame rates of somewhere between fifteen and twenty frames, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, no way to, to adjust your po uh, your interpupillary distances or anything like that. So, <laughs> you immediately got motion sickness within the yes. first. 30 <laughs> seconds of viewing it right, right? yeah no doubt. but at the same time it was enough to get you excited going oh this technology is going to be awesome when they get it working and yeah. if you look down at the bottom of my screen it says 60 fps and it said 60 fps the whole time yeah i, I know the, the bottom I right yeah eye on that actually yeah. yeah um guys i gotta go it's yeah. been really super fun to talk yeah i agree yeah. and i Totally appreciate that you guys let me come in and sit in today. I had a really great time, and it's been really informative. And if I can, I'll probably check in again tomorrow and see. Yeah. Yeah, we'd love it. Because now I have a little better idea of what's where and, and how to get around. And plus, I don't have a lot of stuff on my agenda for tomorrow, so I can there, kind of... There's a lot to see that you probably haven't checked out. Like yeah, uh, all sure. the, the the exhibitors have a ton of stuff. I mean, I just touched on it for ten minutes when you were in there with me. Yeah, it's it's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So thanks, Karam. Th thank you yeah, guys thanks. for for doing this, and uh, I hope our audience will enjoy it as well. And maybe some of them will show up at your conference. Uh, <laughs> There's only one day left. Well, yeah. So I'll I'll make sure I get this video uploaded tonight. And Josh, okay. if you can send me a link, whatever, for that I can add in the description for the video for people that might want to check in. Sure. In the yeah, and the other time. thing is, you know, we'll be doing events in the future. And also, if you're out there and you want to do an event, we'd be happy to uh, rent the space to you, uh, lend you some of our text team and, and whatever else. So, um, you know, don't be afraid to ask because you never know what kind of a event you could put up in the in our Sky City or any kind of custom space. Right, awesome. Yeah, and, and feel free to let us know when you when you got something coming up. We'll gladly promote it because honestly, like, we don't have anything else to do right now, right? There's no real <laughs> shows happening, so there's a lot of people yearning for shows of any kind, you know? Yeah, so, it's true. Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, you'll probably find open ears there. So thanks awesome. again, guys. It's been awesome. And I'm going to get to edit this, put some tra trailers on it and whatever. Have you not uploaded to YouTube? Cool. And uh, yeah, we'll promote it too, Chris. Don't worry about okay. it. Yeah, yeah. I appreciate it. I'll, yeah, I'll send Josh the link to the video as soon as it's done uploading. Right on. And uh, yeah. Awesome, Sounds good. guys. All right. Thank you Take very care, much. Guys. And thanks, Chris. Have a great rest of your good conference. You. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Cheers. Appreciate good it. You. Bye. Take care. Okay, and that was Josh and Kareen live from, well, live from VRTO. Unfortunately, due to technical difficulties, we couldn't stream it live as we originally wanted. But hopefully I'll get this uploaded today so we can do it as close to real time as possible. So maybe people can get a chance to show in tomorrow. And uh, I hope you enjoyed yourselves. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and if you click the notification bell, you know the deal. You get notified whenever we put out a video so you won't miss anything. Okay, thanks everybody and have a great day.